Hello, my name is Carol McCall, and welcome to AI Equals ROI. I'm an actuary and population health professional, and I'm Chief Health Analytics Officer for CloseLoop.ai, and I'm going to be talking about AI in healthcare. And so today, I wanted to go through three things, so let's get started. The first thing we're going to touch on is a little bit about uh, healthcare's AI and machine learning and, and just the whole market for data science. We're then going to talk a little bit about the core requirements. So if you're going to do AI in healthcare, what is it that you really are talking about here and what needs to happen? And then last but not least, we're going to touch on just a few tangible ROI examples. So here we go. Um, a lot of people talk about AI in healthcare and when you say just AI, it can actually, it doesn't tell you very much. It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And so for some, what comes to mind is the picture, kind of like the one that you see in front of you now, which is kind of robot doctors kind of replacing radiologists and, and pointing out exactly where that problem is. And don't get me wrong, I mean, image analysis is an absolutely fascinating area of ROI uh, for AI. And um, one of my favorite image analysis examples is, is actually this one. So just gonna take a moment and process this. So what do you think, chihuahua or muffin? So in going through this, I actually think I got most of them right, but I gotta tell you this, this little guy in the middle on the top row, um, I could kinda go either way. So seriously though, um, the whole area of image analysis, it's, it's a whole category unto itself and, and it's really not our area of focus. And so what we focus on at Closed Loop is um, probably one of the least sexy areas, um, risk stratification. And, and not only that, now that it's not sexy, the idea isn't really new. And so when you think about it, using historic data for prediction, like this has been around for a long time. And, and so here's how it used to work. So you take in historic claims data and you'd push it through some formula or algorithm. And, and then what comes out is Robert is high risk. And so, and that's been happening, you know, uh, through the late 20th century models. So what we do at closed loop is kind of a 21st century version of that. And so what we do is we take any patient linkable data. And so we'll take claims and electronic health records and labs and data from care management systems and ADT records and wearables and surveys and, and even genomics. And we push that into a machine learning model. And so what you get out isn't just Robert is high risk. What you get out is Robert's in the 99.7th percentile. He's the kind of the highest of the high risk. Um, his risk, here's how it's changed over the last 30 days. And these are the specific data points and contributing factors that best explain his risk. And here's the next best action that you could take. And so when you think about this kind of whole from to state, we've kind of gone from a very opaque model to a very high resolution, from simple categories of risk to very quantified and comprehensive risk profiles, and from using just claims to using essentially any available data. And so you have to ask yourself, why now? So what's, what's changed? If, if risk stratification isn't new, what is new? And it's really three things that have changed. Uh, and the first one is this kind of whole data tsunami. And, and so everybody talks about data and big data, but the fact of the matter is there's a 36% compound annual growth rate in healthcare data. And what people want to do is they want to use that data and the old methods just simply can't handle it. The next change is that everybody's moving to the cloud. Can, and that's great because that's where the algorithms live. And then last but not least is the fundamental shift in payments in healthcare. So, uh, and this statistic here is, is two or three years old where 34% of all payments were tied to what are called APMs or alternate payment models. And what that really means is that we're moving away from fee-for-service to a value-based world. And in a value-based world, you really need to be able to anticipate or predict the future so that you can fundamentally shape it into the one that you've got in the, into the future that you want. So what's all that mean? What it means is that in this gold rush, um, AI has created a bit of a problem. And that problem is that there aren't enough data scientists to go around. 
And what's interesting is that there was a study by McKinsey that a few years ago that said basically there's a shortage, an estimated shortage of quarter of a million data scientists. And if you do manage to get your hands on one, and you got to remember you're competing with Google and Facebook and closed loop, um, they're going to hate their jobs. And the reason they're going to hate their jobs is that is that the first thing you're going to ask them to do is to come in and go clean a bunch of ICD-10 codes. In other words, 80% of the time that data scientists spend is on doing things that they are they least like doing, which is collecting and organizing data and cleaning it. But it's also what they weren't trained to do. And so it's a little bit like hiring the world's best surgeon and then making come in and clean the operating room, right? Which is important work, don't get me wrong. But it's not really why you hired them. So let's look at what it, what it is that we do. Um, and why we think this is important. Um, so here's what we do at Closed Loop. We have a machine learning automation platform that is built specifically for and dedicated to healthcare. And you can think of that as, as being really in two pillars. For folks that have data scientists, what it really is for them on the left side, um, you really want data scientists to have a workbench. And what it does is it allows them to make models better, faster, cheaper than they otherwise would if they have to handle all those things by themselves. The right side is if you actually don't have data scientists, um, but you have data and what you really want are answers. And so there's a catalog of common use cases or templates, if you will, of, of commonly seen examples and needs that people have in healthcare so that they can put in their data and train it specifically to their data and get the answers that they're looking for. And with the shortage in data scientists, but the, the growing need and desire for AI, a platform that can handle both of these situations um, is, is absolutely paramount. So when you look under the hood and you say, no matter who's doing the data science thing, um, here's a quick overview of the main steps that you really need to be able to go through. And so when you think about machine learning in healthcare, these are really the core requirements that you, have to, that you have to be able to handle. And the first one is just on data and data normalization. And it really means being able to clean it up and import it. And if you think about NDC codes, which describe all of the 180 some odd thousand codes for drugs, it's being able to take it from that top number uh, to the one on the bottom, which is the recognized and machine readable form. And a lot of data comes in, you know, from whatever source it is, not necessarily looking like the one on the bottom. And you can spend, well, 80% of your time if you're a data scientist cleaning that type of thing up, but it can actually be automated and handled by hand. The second thing that you do is what data scientists like to call feature engineering, which for regular folks like you and me, just means let's come up with some variables that we think would be predictive of an outcome, right? And some of them are very straightforward. It's taking those codes and turning it into something we recognize like prior diagnosis of heart disease, which could be predictive of something. And so some are more straightforward, but some variables are rather complex. Things like medication adherence or a frailty index or like uh, identifying treatment resistant depression. Those are all important features and they can be created from the data that you just cleaned up. And you really want to have as many of those on hand already pre-built as you possibly can. Once all of that is, is in place, a data frame is created and then you really, you put it into the models and this is where the data, data scientists really have their fun. And you hear them talking about uh, random forest and XG boost and rock curves and AUC and it's sometimes a completely foreign language. But at the end of the day, you really want two things. Out of this step, you really want an accurate model and you want it to be explainable. Because if you can't explain it, it's awfully hard to go to that next step of deployment with something that people feel that they understand and can trust the output. But the last step, this is really where the rubber meets the road. And often this is where you see data scientists just kind of going, hey, you know, my work here is done. And it actually doesn't often involve data scientists. This is where they write a, a lovely note that says, Dear IT, enclosed is my latest model. Please make sure it finds a good home. Love data scientists. You have to get it deployed and you have to get it managed. And at this point, it's really more about monitoring the input streams. Does the data still make sense? Does it still look like the stuff that I, that I built it with? 
you want to monitor the outputs. Are the predictions still actually accurate? Are they starting to drift a little bit, lean to the left? And as you get more and more models or update them and get more and more versions, it's also about auditing and governance. So which model with which feature made which prediction on which date? And you absolutely have to keep all of that under control. So let's take a quick look at what actually comes out of these things, because that's always really useful. So what you're looking at here, this is a, a, an example of a longitudinal view uh, that's looking at, say, admission risk for a single patient. What you're seeing is how that risk actually changes over time along with the explanations of those things. So this is really what you're looking for. So in this case, this is still Robert. What you can see is that Robert starts out in about the 30th percentile. And the reason for that, you can see in these factors listed down below, um, is that because he had a diagnosis uh, and a history of heart disease. And so that was a true statement. It was something that, that was pushing his predictions up. And then all of a sudden, he jumps from the 30th to the 60th percentile. And the reason for that is that we see some new you know, suspects on the scene. We have a diagnosis of uh, COPD, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. We also see a diagnosis of diabetes. And on it goes. And by the end of May, Robert's risk is higher than 96% of the population. And you can see in the lower box at the right, you can also see the specific things for which he is at risk, because it sometimes can be more than one. It can be an admission, it can be a hospital-acquired infection, there's a risk of a serious fall-related injury, adverse drug events, and, and even mortality. It's vital to actually know what people are at risk for in order to know what to do. So let's take uh, a look at a few examples of how these have been used. So with respect to our platform, the first is uh, Medical Home Network and they are the nation's largest Medicaid ACO uh, in the nation. They're located in Chicago, and their challenge was risk stratification for new Medicaid patients where they didn't have a health history. And so what they had done was in 2014, they created a proprietary HRA, and they created a special one because they knew that for their population, which would, was struggling with a lot of uh, what are called social determinants of health, that none of the traditional HRAs would work. So they created a proprietary one, which is great, but then they found themselves struggling with what are some of the natural and inherent limits with HRAs. Is that it's a survey and you can't poke in any other kinds of data. And they wanted to use all of this other data that they were starting to accumulate in terms of claims and, and some of the other data modalities that they had. And so what we did was we took what we call a layered data approach. And you can see how things build in this kind of stair step what we did was, the first thing we said was, let's apply machine learning technology to your social factors. And just that methodology alone gave them a 24% boost in finding the right people. We then added pharmacy data, we added ADT records, which are admission, discharge, and transfer records from hospitals, and we added data from their care management system. And at every single step along the way, you can see that there's an improvement in identifying the right people, in this case, the high risk people for their interventions, and a dramatic decrease in the false positive rates for those predictions. And what that meant was, is that, that their care management program, which had already, its efficacy had already been established, those care management team members were able to spend their time on the right folks. And when they can do that, there was a projected savings uh, from the program. And you can see how it builds up and what it was worth in that, even that first year alone. It's really dramatic improvement. One more example that I'll leave you with, and it's actually rather timely, um, is something we call the C19 index. And so right when the pandemic hit, um, Dave DiCaprio and Andrew I and myself, uh, we asked ourselves a question, and it was whether or not there was anything that we could do. We weren't on the front lines, um, and we certainly didn't have AI that was gonna help to do you know, contact tracing or predict who's gonna get infected or anything like that. But what we could do is we said, we could actually build models that help identify people who might have severe complications in the event that they did get uh, the virus. And so that's exactly what we did. We built a model 
and open sourced the C19 index that predicts the extent to which a person has kind of a heightened vulnerability to serious complications uh, from COVID-19. It's been downloaded and used for more than 10 million people, and you can see some of the organizations listed there. And if you want to check it out, feel free to go to c19index.com. In closing, uh, I first want to thank the folks at AWS for hosting this event. Uh, the world is a dramatically different place than it was even five months ago. And I'll say, while we don't know exactly what's going to happen next, we have an opportunity to shape the future that we want. And it's often catalyzed by events like this that help us imagine something different. And so I want to end by thanking you for being here today. And I hope it helps you imagine something wonderful. Thanks.